Good morning. Welcome to NeoConnect 2020. NeoConnect is NeoCon's online series of resources, programming, and events designed to connect the community throughout the month of June. I'm Monica DiBartolo, NeoCon's Program Director, and I want to thank you for joining us. Today's session is approved for one IDCEC credit for interior designers and one LU credit for architects. Please feel free to refer to the screen for more details. So let's begin. Today's session is titled Introduction to Regenerative Design, Your Role as a Designer for a Thriving Future. Our speaker will define how the role of designers can influence natural and human environments and how to uncover the potential for sustainability and a thriving world. She will discuss how to bring regenerative design to the forefront to ensure that your design strives towards a sustainable and su success successful future. Suzanne Angriano is principal at Ashley McGraw Architects and principal and founder of Vazen Studio in, in Syracuse, New York. Her experience includes a focus on higher education projects and holistic sustainable design work. She believes that every project has great potential to affect people's lives and the environment around them. She has a passion for understanding place and creating unique solutions that speak to the people and environment in an integral and vibrant way. Suzanne was the lead designer of MacArthur Elementary School, which won the 2019 ASID Outcome of Design Honorable Mention and is a 2019 ASID Ones to Watch Award recipient. Please welcome Suzanne Angarano. Thank you, Monica. Thanks for having me this morning. I'm gonna share my screen here. So good morning. Thank you everyone for joining me. Um, as Monica mentioned, I am principal of Ashley McGraw Architects and Vazen Studio. Uh, Vazen Studio is a little new uh, in that uh, we recently launched it as an entity to focus on design strategy and regenerative design. And so this is part of my work from that. So before I kind of dive into what regenerative design is and how you as the designer can use this in your projects, I wanted to kind of share a little bit about why I use this approach in my work and why it's important to me. So as a designer, I truly believe that design has the potential to make the world a better place. And regenerative design is the approach that I use to do that in my work. Um, so regenerative design is a holistic systems approach to the uh, projects that you work on and the people that you work with. It has exponential returns and potential for impact on all of the systems that you are embedded within. And it's an approach and mindset that can help to broaden our boundaries to be more inclusive, understanding, and authentic. Um, it's an approach that I use and I hope that all of you will embark on to do our jobs better and to provide more meaningful interactions and design. Um, so this, it's really near and dear to my heart and something that um, I'm continuing to work on. Uh, it's something that takes a lot of practice. And so I'd like you all to kind of join me in that journey. So I'll share with you a couple of definitions first. Regenerative design uses whole systems thinking to create resilient and equitable systems that integrate the needs of society and the integrity of nature. Another word is regenerative development, and this is the process of cultivating the capacity and capability in people, communities, and other natural systems to renew, evolve, and thrive. It is not about maintaining what is or restoring something to what it was. Rather, it is about creating the capacity for ongoing development towards increasing states of health and vitality. So I'm taking that uh, definition from Lenz's facilitator manual um, and a lot of the other aspects throughout the presentation I'm also taking from that manual. Um, and it was developed by the Center for Living Environments and Regeneration through the University of Colorado, um, oh, sorry, Colorado State University Institute for the Built Environment. Uh, so I'll share a little bit later some of those resources and encourage you to check that out. So first, as an introduction, I'll kind of lay out uh, five key concepts, again, developed uh, by the Colorado State University Institute for the Built Environment. Um, these are five key concepts. There are a lot of other um, 
resources out there that have similar concepts or slightly uh, variations of these, um, but these are the ones that I'm familiar with. So the first one is working in holes rather than parts. So this is the mindset that the world is a system, a nested systems, um, uh, a system of nested systems, not individual parts. So we need to be very cognizant of the relationship between everything and that every part of that is essential to the workings of the systems. Uh, so an example is that if you plant a seed and it grows into a plant, that seed did not just develop on its own. It was impacted and part of a system that included the sun, the rain, the soil, the nutrients in the soil, the other animals and aspects of that ecosystem. So without one part of that system, that seed would not have grown into a plant. Um, and another uh, key concept is being of service. So this is very linked to that whole systems approach. It's that every piece of that system or those systems is a key part of that system and serves a critical need. And each individual of that system is vital to its success. And the larger system depends on each of those aspects. So this is the idea that uh, we want to be in service of our entire system and not focus just on our individual needs. And so an example of this is in, your, in the human body, we have all of our organs and each one serves an integral um, and very important part to making us uh, human and to uh, live. So if one, one organ in our system doesn't work, it is, we're no longer able to, to live. So each organ is in, in service to the function and uh, vitality of our entire body. The third key concept is account for uniqueness. And this is that each place, person, and community has its own unique potential. And we need to work as designers to understand the uniqueness of each of those systems and each of those aspects within the systems to activate authentic change and change that sticks. I mean, how often have you worked really hard as a designer to uh, kind of get buy-in from your clients and share with them why you think certain aspects are the way that they should be in their design solutions, only to find out maybe a couple years down the road that they're not quite using it exactly the way that you thought. And I think that if we can use even just this key concept of regenerative design, our projects will uh, be better for it. And it is that uh, uh, uniqueness and our understanding of that can, that can evolve our projects from problems to potential. So I think a sort of typical approach to projects is that there's maybe some problems or issues that our clients have asked us to solve or to plan for. And rather than looking at this sort of um, problem solving or even sort of negative making something better aspect uh, in design, I'm going to encourage you to look at potential. So this is creating benefit and that mind shift that, mind shift that we are uh, looking to create potential rather than solve problems. And the last one is to move from separate to aligned with nature. Um, and I think this one is incredibly important in that we want to recognize our relationship with nature and not that it's nature against humans, but we are embedded in nature. And so the systems that we will look at are natural, but I would also encourage you to look at it as human and non-human systems. We are not separate from nature. We are aligned with nature and that humans have the potential to be positive contributors to nature. Nature does not simply need our protection, but our collaboration. So how does regenerative design uh, relate to sustainability? This is a question I get often. And sustainability is uh, something that's, I think, uh, vital to uh, de the design industry and something that a lot of us, I'm sure, are very familiar with. And this is not trying to be in opposition to sustainability, but it's an evolution as we move from sustainability towards regeneration. Um, one thing to look at or to consider is that within this fulcrum of trying to uh, become regenerative, I would say that sustainability is kind of right in the middle. Um, it's a little bit of a do-good mentality, the idea that 
Um, if you think about the word sustainability, it's to sustain things. So uh, it's the idea that thing, resources are scarce and we want to save water, save energy. And those are all wonderful things. We want to continue doing those things. But we want to look instead uh, for regeneration as the, uh, a systemic impact and the systemic awareness of how all of the aspects of systems are connected and can impact each other. Uh, I would say that sustainability has a certain um, aspect of we can find solutions. And as I mentioned as part of those key concepts, uh, it's not about solutions. Regeneration is about finding and um, uh, uncovering potential. So a lot of wonderful things have come out of the sustainability movement, and I would say that regeneration is an extension of that, and we're evolving towards uh, digging a little deeper, having greater understanding, and looking at full systems awareness. So how, is you, how you as a designer can uh, practice and implement regenerative design in your projects? I would say this is the, those key concepts they seem a little straightforward but when you really look at how you might implement them in projects it becomes a little overwhelming so the approach that i'm going to take in the rest of this presentation is to try to kind of help you uh, take little bite-sized pieces out of that and start to tackle this in your own work so the first big thing that at least helped me when i embarked on this uh, journey is that it is about building capacity in yourself and then in others to think this way. So it's that mindset shift uh, and to uh, work with all of the systems and to account for all of the systems that we're a part of and then engage those stakeholders. Uh, so it's the holistic systems thinking, which I like to kind of link to biophilia as something that people are relatively familiar with. And biophilia is sort of the practice or uh, belief that humans have this innate uh, urge to be one with nature, that we, uh, we can enhance our lives through um, a, a relationship with nature, that we thrive on patterns and colors and textures that are related to nature. And biophilia uh, connects with regenerative design in that it's part of that holistic systems thinking and understanding. We want to make sure that we account for not just the human systems, but all of the non-human systems as well. And then really make sure that we have a deep understanding and listen to all of those stakeholders. And those stakeholders are human and non-human stakeholders. So some of them might not have a voice and we wanna make sure that we're accounting for them and understanding their needs and how they link to all of the other aspects in the system. So in order to tackle this in my projects, I've kind of taken the key concepts and uh, kind of evolve them a little bit for my own use into a framework with three parts to it. So my approach is that deep systems understanding, uh, the ability to listen and build capacity, and then evolve potential. And if you look at the five key concepts in relationship to those, you can see that there's parts and pieces of each of those key concepts that relate to each of those aspects in the framework that I've put together. So the systems, uh, I, I, understanding systems, is that we want to make sure that we identify all of the relevant human and non-human systems and how they interact. And then there's aspects of that to make sure that we understand the constraints of that or the depth of that. So having, um, we want to expand our boundaries, but we also want to make sure we identify the extent of those boundaries so that it's not too overwhelming. Uh, the entire world can be considered a system, but if we took that approach for all of our projects, we probably wouldn't get anywhere. <laughs> um, so the next one is to listen and build capacity. And as I mentioned, that's setting a field for authentic understanding. We want to really listen to all of the stakeholders and then also build in ourselves as designers to listen and understand those stakeholders, but then facilitate and allow for some cross uh, collaboration in terms of having the all of the stakeholders listen to each other and uh, account for why each of those uh, aspects of the system are important. And then the last one is to, uh, to evolve potential um, after identifying opportunity. So each project, each system has uniqueness that we want to make sure we understand and then identify opportunities and evolve potential. Um, and these are the aspects that then um, develop into, can be brought into your design and uh, push that forward. 
Um, and I would say that an important part here is that it's not about the resulting project or resulting design that is regenerative, but it's the process and then the exponential returns of that process and environment that uh, creates regeneration and regenerative potential in your projects. So I'm going to kind of talk about uh, how I've done this in a couple of examples. So the first one is Not Hatch Hollow. Um, this is a project that is about to go into construction at Binghamton University. Um, and the images you see on the screen on the left is how that site looked about uh, in the 70s, 60s, 70s. And then the house that stands on it uh, today. But it's about 70 acres. It's a nature preserve that uh, the family who owned this property donated to Binghamton University. And the university is going to take this land and uh, provide a biological research facility on the site for their students. And uh, we were engaging with Binghamton University to kind of see what this project might look like. And it became clear that this was a perfect opportunity for a living building challenge project project. And so that's what we've embarked on and task to tackle. And um, so we used uh, regenerative principles to guide us towards the Living Building Challenge project. Uh, the first thing that we wanted to do is really understand the system and the place of this build, of where this building would be. Um, and so these are some images of a day that we had that was called Biophilia Day. And um, you can see there's a beautiful pond on the site. There's rivers that run through hills, valleys. Um, the nature is just absolutely stunning. Um, we also engaged uh, with community members of Binghamton, the, the city. Also the faculty and staff of the university and students. So you'll see some images here of the biology students kind of talking about what work they would be doing here. And that's really about kind of all of the stakeholders, human and non-human stakeholders, to get to know each other and listen and understand uh, what each could bring to the table for this project. And then we wanted to kind of take a look at what, what is that system of, what are the boundaries of our system for this project? And then what, what are the systems within it? So we you know, analyzed the site, um, walked through the site, met with some of the stakeholders, and then looked at what that system uh, included. So you know, there's the natural uh, environment of that uh, site, as well as what the students and faculty would be doing on that. And all of those are key aspects of the project. And I think this is a really, it's probably one of the more straightforward uh, at, examples of when you look at regenerative design in terms of, okay, it's a natural environment, it kind of exudes that natural uh, systems approach. Um, and But we were able to use this uh, regenerative design approach in terms of the stakeholders and understanding systems to really identify the opportunities and make sure that the project spoke to the site, to the systems, and would allow the resulting project to be part of the process that the students and faculty would embark on to allow this uh, site to thrive. And so you can see this is exactly where that yellow house stands. And this is a rendering of what that might look like when we start construction. And it just exudes the, the, the place. And you can see the dynamic uh, nature of the, the building in terms of natural and human systems. Another example, which is very different than Nuthatch Hollow, is Silverman Hall renovation at SUNY Upstate. So this is a historic building um, right in the heart of Syracuse City. And it, uh, we were charged with renovating this to house the College of Health Professions. So this is within um, SUNY Upstate, which you know, has a lot of medical aspects uh, and academic aspects, but um, the College of Health Professions, it became clear as we started embarking on that listening exercise that they are kind of hidden from the rest of SUNY Upstate and the rest of the medical university. You can see on this plan here, it's that building is highlighted in red, um, but it's close to Syracuse University. Uh, to the north of that bubble is the rest of uh, SUNY Upstate, the more medical forward aspects. Um, and it's kind of hidden, the site slopes down, so it's a little bit downhill from the rest of the campus. And then it continues to slope down and you hit uh, Route 81 and then downtown Syracuse. And it 
it didn't really have a big uh, identity. So this approach for this project in terms of understanding the systems was looking more at the human, social, and institutional systems that would impact and be impacted by this renovation. And it was very clear that um, there were a lot of various systems at play within those uh, aspects. And one of the exercises we did as part of our regenerative design um, investigations was looking at the essence of those different systems. So one of those systems is the department, uh, the Ho College of Health Professions. Another system is the building itself. Um, and that's the, the, the physical uh, facility as well as kind of what it means in history and throughout time. And then there's SUNY Upstate as a system, as well as the surrounding Syracuse community. And how all of those uh, systems played together was really eye-opening to, um, for us as the design team to understand, but also for them to hear from each other and understand what was important to them and how each part of that system would impact the others. And as part of that, we, we were really able to develop um, something that would be authentic and very specific and unique to Silverman Hall. Um, one of the ways that we set out to make sure that this project would, um, would develop into something grounded in, in the regenerative aspects that we set out to do was develop a purpose statement. And that purpose statement was to revitalize and transform historic Silverman Hall for the academic needs of today and the future in a way that generates pride, cultivates interdisciplinary collaboration, and is state of the art so that the identity of the College of Health Professions is highlighted within the upstate and Syracuse community and that students and prospective students are welcomed into a vibrant and all-inclusive academic environment. And so I know that was kind of a lot, that purpose statement, but it really embodied all of the aspects of each of those systems and how they were hoping um, and really wanting to interact and uh, re relate with one another so that they could thrive into the future. So embarking on that investigation and developing that purpose statement is really the path forward so that this project can be regenerative for all of its systems into the future. So you've heard two examples of projects, uh, design projects that are in development. Um, and you might be thinking, okay, I could probably facilitate some of this on my projects, but I'm gonna take a little different approach now and talk to you about how we can use this approach and regenerative uh, thinking to approach a lot of other types of things. And so I'll kind of recap that. Um, Part of this, part of being a designer and embarking on generative thinking is to develop capacity in yourselves and then help other stakeholders to develop capacity in them to listen and to have this mindset shift. And that really takes time and work and practice. And it's something that I'm still working on every day um, and looking at how I can embed that in my work. And then even eke out that additional potential in projects that maybe don't quite seem like they'll uh, be good for this approach. And then it, you see that it is. It really helps your mindset to be broader, to think uh, and dig deeper, to understand and be authentic and unique to each, uh, each challenge. Um, and so I'm, I'm very passionate about this and I'm, I'm looking at how I can embed this into all of my work. So I'm using regenerative principles to uh, look at how we might uh, respond to COVID-19 in, return, in returning to K-12 schools. So Ashley McGraw, uh, my firm does a lot of uh, K-12 uh, renovation and new construction work. And this is a hot topic, I'm sure for everyone on this uh, presentation, but specifically for our clients, some of them have an idea how to make it through, how to fo uh, move forward, and some are, are struggling. And I think regenerative thinking and regenerative um, frameworks can really help this approach to make sure that we're accounting for the whole student and the whole system of the K-12 schools. So if you think back to the three parts um, and how, how they relate to the key concepts of regenerative design, we can start to kind of unpack all of the complexities to returning to school post COVID-19. So again, number one is identify and understand systems. So what are the systemic impacts of what we might do? There's a lot um, out there that's, it's, it's helpful, it's great information, but it's about how can we establish six foot circles, um, circulation paths that provide barriers to this uh, virus, 
But in, in terms of a systems understanding, I question that a little bit in that, okay, it's providing a barrier, a physical barrier to the virus. What other barriers might it be creating that might negatively impact our students and, um, and hinder learning as we move forward? So I, I want to embark on this in terms of a system understanding to understand the greater aspects of this. And I'll go into that a little bit uh, in a minute. Uh, so the next part of that is to listen and build capacity. So we want to have holistic understanding. We want to understand a balance of institutional facilities and human mindfulness as we approach uh, the reopening of schools. We want to think broad, broadly and listen deeply to all of the stakeholders, the students, the teachers, the staff, the community, as well as how they might be uh, kind of concerned or nervous about uh, coming back to school in the fall. And you know, this is something that no one has encountered this before. So some of us, you know, we're kind of fumbling our way through a little bit and trying our best to create solutions. And um, I think part of that is that there isn't a solution. There is no one solution. We want to make sure that instead we shift that mindset to potential. What are the potential outcomes of this pandemic that can in turn um, actually provide elements of regeneration to our, our students and to our schools. And that is the opportunity that I, uh, in the work that I've been doing, have, been, have identified. And those opportunities can help to then evolve potential. And I'd really like to, for us to look at how can we leverage this disruption to transform education and transform uh, the concept of school. Uh, so, in, in terms of reimagining learning environments and using the pandemic as an opportunity, um, I think we have this unique opportunity through the pandemic to enhance educational delivery. So this is a framework. Uh, I know the colors are sort of similar to my past framework. They're not totally related. <laughs> um, but this is the framework that through regenerative thinking and regenerative practice I've developed to help uh, the design team help our clients and districts to move forward. Uh, it's an organizing framework so that we can look at the whole system. It's not just about the facility. It's not just about education. It's not just about space. It's about looking at the interactions and how the system of each of those aspects relate to each other and impact each other. So understanding what are the essential functions in terms of health and safety, um, and, you know, hand washing, uh, wearing face masks, but also what might that do for the well-being, mental um, and emotional uh, well-being of our students. If they're wearing a mask all the time, what impacts might that have on their well-being? But then what impact might that have on the way that education is delivered and how teachers are able to uh, perform their role in education? So this is the approach that we are taking uh, as a holistic system to hopefully identify opportunities to uh, not just provide barriers to the virus, but to provide um, a, a holistic learning environment. And that might look nothing like what schools do today. Uh, and I think that this approach, this uh, regenerative mindset and mindset shift um, allows us to broaden our minds to looking at all of this together. Um, and so I know that probably seems like a lot, but I think it's really about taking those little steps. Those three bubbles that I shared in terms of my approach are in, uh, intended to help you tackle this in your own work and start somewhere. Um, I did not become a regenerative practitioner overnight. I would say that, say that it's something that I'm still working at actively every day in all of the work that I do. But the idea is that those impacts go beyond the project um, and they can be continued and, and provide exponential uh, evolution and impacts throughout the time lifespan of that project and even then some. And I think that the world needs us as designers to show up with this higher level of thinking so that we can provide uh, a world that's better positioned and has and can uncover that potential. Um, if we don't show up regeneratively, we'll, we'll go back to how we did things before. And I, I think that this world and our society uh, deserves, deserves our interaction at this regenerative level. 
So uh, a lot of the concepts, again, that I shared, especially at the beginning, are directly from lenses, which uh, you can find at uh, their organization is clearabundance.org. There's a lot of fantastic resources on there. I hope that I spark some curiosity in, in you and that you'll go there. You can check out some videos, um, some publications that they have. I also mentioned Living Building Challenge, which is a really nice pairing to regenerative design. And uh, if you're not familiar, it's livingfutures.org. Another regenerative uh, practitioner sort of um, uh, organization is regenesisgroup.com. So I really encourage you to check some of these out, start this mindset shift in your own practice, and start building that capacity in yourself to you know, embark on this journey with it with me to, to have an impact on the world and to change the world for the better. So with that, I'll take some questions. So somebody asked about the, the link to the Colorado State Studies. Um, so I'll back up a slide and so you can see um, those, visit those websites. Um, again, I encourage you to, to do that. Uh, so can, another question is, can regenerative thinking assist in equity principles and social environmental justice? Absolutely. I think that um, the idea that every part of the system is vital to its uh, vital to its performance and being able to thrive is uh, completely aligned with the principles of social and environmental justice. It's the idea that every aspect of the system uh, plays a role and is significant and deserves to be heard and to be um, highlighted in that system as part of um, something that makes that system thrive. So absolutely, I think that that thinking and that approach, again, it's that whole system's thinking, making sure that we account for the uniqueness of every, every aspect in that system. So another question is, do you find that this technique ends up taking on more than the original extents of the building project and how does this process impact project budget? That's a great question that comes up a lot and I think it comes up because we're, we're trying to find the extents of the project and find, find the boundaries. But I think in the end, uh, what I have found is that setting out it with this, this approach on projects um, in, the, in the design process saves time and saves, saves uh, money in terms of making sure that we kind of get it right the first time. So it, it's helping us to um, listen to all the stakeholders to really uncover that true potential and uh, provide a response that is unique and, and really authentic to that project. So I think this thinking, while it, it seems like there's a lot up front, I think it's, it's kind of doing uh, our due diligence or even beyond due diligence and making sure that uh, we account for everything from the beginning. I know that I, there's a lot of times when we kind of are halfway through the design process and you kind of hear for some new information. It's like, oh, that would have been really great if I knew that at the beginning. And I think this uh, approach helps us to kind of make sure we're getting all that information at the beginning. Um, so how do you identify what and who all of the stakeholders are in each project, particularly when they are stakeholders that are unable to speak for themselves? So this is where research, it uh, really comes into play. Uh, you don't just jump in and meet with your uh, stakeholder, human stakeholder group and start uh, going on with the, the engagement process. Uh, there is research to be done up front to understand the ecological uh, stakeholders that, again, that might not be able to speak them for themselves, understand um, those non-human systems at play and how, how the project site and systems, human systems, non-human systems might be impacted. And that, that can be a little tricky. Um, we work with, closely with our consultants as well as we kind of worked with uh, historians on some projects or um, in the Nuthatch Hollow example, we worked with the faculty who are biological researchers or um, the, that university has a farming agricultural aspect to them. So working with those stakeholders to kind of provide a voice for some of those non-human stakeholders. Um, it's important to account for that as best you can, but it, it takes upfront work and some um, research. 
So here is another one. It's what is the difference of regenerative design and design thinking? Um, so I think it's all, I would kind of say that it's all about, it's all mixed together as one in terms of um, regenerative design is an approach that includes the way that you think and process the, the systems and the stakeholders within your, pro your project. So there, you can't have regenerative design without regenerative thinking or regenerative frameworks and practice. Um, so it, it's part of its practice and approach and thinking that's all uh, wrapped up into this uh, method. Another question is, do you have other regenerative design projects ongoing in the office and how do you go about getting these projects? So oh, I would say that other than uh, not Hatch Hollow, which is uh, pursuing Living Building Challenge certification, um, that one was just very clearly uh, regenerative uh, living building uh, aspect. But this is, as I'm, I was trying to kind of uh, make clear, I think regenerative design uh, practices can be embarked upon for all projects and that it's not just about the ones that maybe you're hired to do as a regenerative design project but it's a it's a mindset that can help you do all of our projects all of your projects better and then in, in engage all of the stakeholders in a more holistic way um, so it's it's really interesting actually in when I started working on uh, in this way with my my clients and project teams there is you could see the shift in, in almost immediately uh, I got feedback that wow this process it's all about the process this process was really amazing and I got a lot out of this I understand what we're doing I understand the other people's and other systems um, uh, what their priorities are, what they might be looking for. And it's, you can kind of just see that shift in the capacity of the stakeholder groups to think about their project differently and to make that shift from problem solving to solution or problem solving uh, to potential. Um, are there documents designers can use to help follow this approach more closely? This is one where I would really encourage you to check out those resources that I have uh, up on the screen here. Um, and it's, it's not, it takes a lot of practice. It's not easy. You're not going to get this overnight in terms of being able to put it in, into practice. Um, it takes building that capacity in yourself, again, that I'm still working on. So what I presented today in terms of the, the three aspects that I start out with is is my approach to taking regenerative thinking and regenerative frameworks in my own in my own language and in my own approach um, that works for me. And I think as I get better at this, that might um, grow and expand and evolve. Uh, but those are the those are the key, I guess, steps or parts of the the mindset that I have embarked upon because that's how I can do this in my projects. Um, so I would encourage you to check out those resources and then you can take uh, the framework that I uh, developed um, or you can kind of develop your own, um, whatever works in terms of how your mind can think about this. Um, it has so much potential and so much uh, expanse that it can be uh, it can be challenging and I think it's important to take it one step at a time and just practice. Um, where do you see the most critical breaks in current regenerative systems and how are you seeking to address them as a regenerative practitioner? That's a good one. Um, I would say that it's, there's the, the overcoming of uh, speaking for the non-human systems is, is difficult. Um, we, Sometimes that's maybe where, in, in relationship to a previous question, that's maybe where there's not as much time or capability in the design team to embark upon on that understanding and that anal analysis in terms of those systems. So I think um, it's we need to have account for that and try our, our absolute best to uh, look as deeply into those systems as possible and see what impacts are, are what systems are impacted by your projects. Um, 
That is a big challenge. Uh, and I would say that that's one that is easily kind of overlooked and dismissed. Um, and I think we just need to keep practicing and get better at that. And to the point where it, it isn't so um, outside of our scope anymore. Um, I think it has the, the potential to make all of the projects more robust and that systems understanding com more complete. Um, you, you can't really truly understand the system without the non-human uh, aspects of that. So I think that's where we need to provide some more focus um, and development there. Can students be introduced to regenerative design and thinking? Does holistic thinking connect with these concepts? Um, absolutely. I think students, uh, they're a key part of the system. Um, so in K-12 environments, uh, I think getting their perspective and the way that they see the system that they're a part of, I think is, is a unique perspective and they're a valuable contributor to that system as well. So if we can, I think you can bring some of that thinking and some of those frameworks in a way that's attainable to them. Um, and I think that'll enhance, enhance the, the work that you're doing. Um, see. I think I've answered the majority of these. Um, do you have trouble uh, following this process with pushback in project timelines and cost? Um, one of the really important ways to kind of uh, make sure that the benefits and opportunities is seen by the stakeholders, especially in this case, the, the project leadership, is to bring them along in that process and then bring it back to the forefront each time that you meet with them. So for instance, um, for Silverman Hall, we developed that purpose statement. And I think it would be pretty easy to kind of uh, go through the process of developing uh, and researching that information to develop that purpose statement. And then, okay, tie it in a bow and we'll move on to design. But I think to kind of make sure that the project leadership understands the importance of that is to bring that purpose statement back every time you meet with them and to kind of say, has anything changed? Does it still ring true and resonate with you? And then show specifically how your design moving forward links back to that purpose statement and is following along in the steps that you, uh, or the direction that you set out to do uh, your project in. So I think when you're able to do that and make sure that you kind of continue to bring that through, uh, the, the pushback is, is not there uh, anymore. It's something that then, again, the, the stakeholders say, wow, this really made a difference. I see how it's all linked together. I see how the design process is um, bringing that forward and responding to the system's needs. Uh, so in the case of Silverman Hall, again, um, we've been able to develop the design in a way that really responds to their purpose statement in terms of highlighting the college of health professions, um, making sure that they kind of understand their history and link to their community. And all of those interactions are going to be uh, fostered and uh, maintained throughout the design process. So it's something that I think really enhanced the, the design direction of the project and allowed the stakeholders to see, okay, there was definitely uh, a reason for the approach. Some good questions here, thank you. Um, Here's one that says, uh, the approach is mostly theoretical. Do we have some practical examples or is it basically just a way of thinking? Um, I would say it's both. So it is a way of thinking. It's an approach for designers to kind of embed into your projects of understanding how all of the systems interact and can impact each other. Um, 
And so the practical examples that I shared with you are they, they, there are maybe other methods at getting deeper into your projects and stakeholder engagement and those types of things, but the systems and holistic uh, thinking that's uh, developed from regenerative uh, development is is a way of making sure that you're understanding the relationships, patterns, and extents of your systems and bringing that to the forefront of your project work. Um, so I would, I would say it's both. Somebody's asking for a little bit more about Nuthatch Hollow. Uh, so that is a, the project, the building itself is about 3,500 square feet. Uh, the site is about 70 acres. And um, so it's, it's a small project, but there's it. I think it packs a lot of uh, potential in terms of responding to the systems uh, that uh, are part of that site and providing something that's authentic and unique to that site and to the needs of uh, the students and the the uh, site that it's on. Um, so another one is, uh, what has been your most unexpected regenerative design challenge and how did you approach this project? Um, I would, I would say that it's not necessarily a regenerative design challenge, but, uh, in terms of an unexpected, um, approach is maybe with what we're facing today with uh, responding to COVID-19 in schools and, um, it was unexpected in the sense that I think initially we attribute regenerative design to a design project. And I think the more I work in this way and the more that I use these frameworks, I'm able to look at the world um, and the things that I'm encountering in a different way and apply uh, systems thinking to various things. So I think using systems thinking for uh, responding to COVID in, in K-12 schools has been a really interesting um, and unexpected uh, journey and a way to approach that. And it's something that I'm seeing, uh, we've been working with a group of superintendents to kind of see what their concerns are, listen to how they're approaching things. And it was, it was really interesting to see how at first, while some of them had a good path forward, some were really, um, challenged by this in terms of where do you start how are they supposed to uh, uh you know please everybody or account for all of the information and, and really focus then on the students and how the students and, and teachers are able to continue with school and when i started uh applying the regenerative systems thinking to to those conversations it started to kind of break it down into aspects that they could start tackling so rather than, oh my goodness, we have to open up school and there's so many things to think about and I could see almost the panic in some of their, their eyes. And, but if we started breaking that down and looking at how various aspects would interact, you could see them kind of just, uh, some of that chaos and um, uh, challenging aspects were, would started to dissolve and it was something that they could start tackling uh, system by system and then look, look at all of those systems holistically together. Um, and I think it really helped their thinking. And it's also then evolved into a way that we can approach um, helping them through that process and uh, engage uh, with their communities uh, and with their students to start to find a way forward that responds to each district's uh, uh, unique needs. So each district has has a different set of challenges, a different set of community concerns, and being able to think about uh, how they're going to reopen school with a regenerative mindset, um, I think has really been beneficial to them and wasn't really expecting that. We didn't set out uh, with that to be a regenerative project um, per se, and, but that that mindset and that approach has really helped. Are there any other questions? Uh, 
Uh, well, if there aren't any other questions, again, I really encourage you to check out the resources that I have up on the screen, or you can contact me directly. Uh, my email address is Suzanne at Vazen.com. Um, if you have any questions or would like to have a further discussion um, to see how you might be able to implement this with your projects, I would uh, really enjoy that opportunity. Um, and I would just encourage all of you to kind of think about uh, the systems of your projects and how you might be able to uh, start with this mindset shift to enhance your projects. Suzanne, thank you for that refreshing presentation on this very exciting design approach. Um, we are very much appreciated. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Please join us tomorrow for contradictions inclusive design for all generations. Have a great day and be well. Thank you. Thank you.